all good things must inevitably come to an end. Your favourite TV series, book or game can't go on forever as much as you may want it to. But in most cases, having something end is what makes us appreciate having it in the first place. I'm sure most would rather have something they love end on a high note, instead of it overstaying its welcome and seeing it slowly wither and die as a shell of its former self. But often, even the success of a paragon of excellence can be cut short or be left underdeveloped, whether that's due to outside influences or just plain bad luck. And while examples of this are probably more commonly seen in TV shows and movies, it can happen for games all the same. And as you might have guessed by the title, this is the case with the hit RTS series Supreme Commander and its lead designer Chris Taylor. Starting with 1997's Total Annihilation, Chris had already become a household name in the gaming community due to its widespread success, both commercial and critical. Ten years later, he would continue his legacy with Supreme Commander, an excellent title that developed the core concept of Total Annihilation and would itself arguably be held in even higher regard. This success led to an expansion and eventual sequel, which unfortunately didn't meet the expectations of a lot of existing fans. And that's the last we'd hear about the series, leaving a deafening silence that has fans wishing for more, even to this day. Due to a multitude of different factors, Chris Taylor and his studio Gas Powered Games would sell the intellectual property rights to the series, and were stuck by hard times soon after Spring Commander 2's release, which sadly led to their closure in 2018. Supreme Commander was a flash in the pan, a series that in my opinion still had room to grow and was unfortunately unable to, largely in part due to outside influences. But like I said earlier, having something end can make us truly appreciate it for what it is today. And to do that properly, we're going to start by taking a trip back to 1997 and see where everything began. If you're a strategy fan, and if you're watching this video, I assume you are, then you've surely heard of Total Annihilation. It was developed by Cave Dog Entertainment, a company founded by Humongous Entertainment in order to branch out of their main venture of making kids games, like their successful Putt Putt and Spy Fox series. A young Chris Taylor served as designer and project lead on Total Annihilation, the company's first title and Chris's first RTS. It was released in 1997 to immense praise from critics and customers alike, and nowadays it's considered by many to be one of the best real-time strategy games ever created. Personally, I never played Total Annihilation before making this video, so it was interesting to find that the origins of Supreme Commander were so apparent in this 22-year-old game. Sci-fi setting, a starting king unit, two main resources, lots of robots, you get the idea. While it's clearly dated, it's still a firm favourite of many grassroots RTS players today. The game would go on to receive two expansions, however Chris would leave just prior to the release of the first. Taking some of Cave Dog's other employees with him, he founded Gas Powered Games in May of 1998, with their first full game release as a brand new and fully independent game studio being Dungeon Siege, an action RPG published by Microsoft in 2002. While not an RTS like I'm sure many at the time had hoped, it was nonetheless very well received, and it would even get a sequel in 2005. And that's not the company's only significant event that year. Landing in August, PC Gamer issue number 139 featured a bold front page, stating that the creator of Total Annihilation was here to reinvent the genre once again with his new project, Supreme Commander, the spiritual successor to the game that had put him on the map nearly 10 years prior. Despite working with Microsoft on both Dungeon Siege titles and having a short stint with Electronic Arts, Gas Powered Games would partner with publisher THQ for Supreme Commander, who were undoubtedly excited to work with the creator of Total Annihilation. I imagine the financial potential certainly wasn't lost on them either, given that Supreme Commander was tipped early on to be the spiritual successor to such a beloved title. Once fans heard that it was in the works, there was really no going back. People were excited, and at E3 2006, the public got their first real look at the game, and at what they could expect from an invigorated Chris Taylor and Gas Powered Games. What was on display was a truly massive, deep, and tactical RTS, and when watching interviews for the game before its release, 
you can tell Chris and his team knew they had something special on their hands. Huge. The weapons pack enormous punches. Nuke, you can exchange nukes. And when you have this entire theater of war with the full zoom, what you get to do is pull back. You get a volume. So now you've got nukes going up into this volume where you've got anti-nukes coming up. You've got spy planes flying at one altitude. You've got fighters and bombers here. You've got, you know, uh, torpedo bombers down here. You've got the strata of your of your simulation and it's it takes you a, completely away from the old school model of being your head what i think of as your head stuffed into a sandbox chris's obvious excitement and passion at the time was palpable recently i was lucky enough to be able to have a chat with him and ask about how much pressure he felt making a spiritual successor to one of the most loved rts's of its time and how much he'd been looking forward to returning to the genre that made him a household name well, I think the pressure, if you will, would come from the idea that if you like were asked to do something and you didn't know what you were going to do, <laughs> like you didn't kind of have some ideas up your sleeve. So by the time I finally started writing the design documents for Supreme Commander, I got up on Saturday morning on a weekend at 6 a.m. and went down to my computer and I started typing and I typed for six hours from 6 a.m. until noon. It just constant typing, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you the reason why, because I had a publisher showing up that was interested in publishing the game, but there was no design document. <laughs> so I was like, I better write this design, but it just flowed out of my fingers. I got up on Sunday morning, same thing. So Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and I got up at 6 a.m. and I typed until noon. Now I never get up at 6 a.m. Okay, so that, that story is kind of amazing. It's like 6 a.m., but, but I got up two days in a row, 12 hours, Founded out this design document and you just can't do that unless you have the design yeah. more or less in your head Definitely. You, it, you can't create in that, those hours you just type it was just a pure that's my that's my frantic typing you know really just a stream of consciousness the stream of consciousness yeah for its time the scale and scope of Supreme commander was simply massive not only in its maps but also in its mechanics as far as its technological prowess, the game did many things that were considered far ahead of the curve, such as having built-in dual monitor support and also multi-core processing, where the game would assign different tasks to individual CPU cores if you had them. And remember, this is 2007 we're talking about, so it meant that there weren't an insignificant number of complaints leveled at the game for its requiring of a fairly beastly computer, though that's luckily not a concern nowadays. After releasing a demo in early February 2007, Gaspard Games delivered the finished title later that same month, and the overwhelming positive response was undeniable. Supreme Commander was an excellent game. And with the only main complaint being its poor performance on low-end systems, it's really only gotten better with age. And I'm not just talking about the performance, the gameplay easily holds up as one of my favourite RTSs of all time, and for those who haven't played it, I and many others still wholeheartedly believe it's just as enjoyable today as it's ever been. The game presents itself a bit like a war game. You, the player, are the Supreme Commander, and it's your job to manage your massive armies and far-reaching military infrastructure. This is made possible by the game's strategic zoom mechanic. What this allows is for you to zoom out to get an entire view of the battlefield, so you can see everything that's going on. Conversely, it also allows you to zoom right down into single units, which gives a sense of scale that's not commonly seen in other RTSs. There are other smart mechanics too that help to give the game a truly strategic feel, like an advanced unit queuing system that allows multiple orders to be sequentially assigned and amended on the fly. When you start, you're given the choice of three factions to play as, and each have their own individual campaigns. Interestingly, there's no bad guys, each have their own lore and rational motivations, and they're unique enough so that playing any of them feels markedly different from the others. The UEF are the core human Earth faction, and feature conventional weaponry and generally more brawn than their opponents. The Cybrin are made out of symbiotes, which are humans who appear themselves with an artificial intelligence. While on average they're not as powerful as the UEF, the units are really versatile and they can adapt better to different battlefield situations. Lastly, the Aeon Illuminate are humans who follow the ideas of an alien species, and they just want peace. Peace that they will achieve by wiping out the other two groups, of course. While the story isn't going to win any Oscars, the lore is actually surprisingly deep. The campaign is a good way to spend your time if you're just playing solo. But whether you do that or jump straight into skirmish or multiplayer, the reason we're all here is the gameplay. 
As you may have been able to glean, combat is the primary focus in Supreme Commander. There are no diplomatic victories here, it all comes down to who can forge the strongest army and command them to its fullest potential. No matter which faction you choose, you begin each game with an Armoured Command Unit, or ACU for short. This powerful walker can really just do it all, build, repair, fight, and explode with a gigantic nuclear blast if it's destroyed. A carryover from Total Annihilation was the way Supreme Commander handled resource generation. Instead of the classic pick up resources and deliver to depot, here your two resources are streamed by the production buildings, so you've always got a constant income into your storage facilities. This means you can effectively start building whatever you want, whenever you want, despite how many, or how little, resources you may have. But if your overall resource cost per second is higher than your income per second, your supply is going to drain. So you've got to make sure you don't overextend and cripple your economy for risk of causing enormous resource drain. What this means is that inexperienced players can completely stunt their economies in the early game quite easily, so freaking out the system early is going to be extremely beneficial for you in the long run. Units and buildings are split between three tiers, which can be accessed by upgrading your tier 1 factories and manufacturing high level construction units. In my opinion, the system has been balanced to near perfection. While all factions have access to all three tiers and have a similar base set of unit types and buildings, there are a lot of little nuances that make them all unique. While there's too many for me to list, an example that demonstrates this are the shield generators. While all three factions have access to a tier 2 shield, they all vary between one another in subtle yet significant ways. Some are cheaper with a smaller radius, while others are more expensive but can tank more shots than their counterparts. And this extends to nearly every unit and building in the game, so while factions can seem similar on the surface, only a few minutes of gameplay will reveal that they are actually fairly unique, requiring the employment of radically different tactics to field effectively. As for the tiers, it takes a long enough time to research each one of them, and they're all significantly more powerful than the preceding one, so reaching the next level and unleashing its strength is incredibly satisfying. For example, here's a single tier 3 assault bot absolutely mincing an army of tier 1s. After tier 3, there are what's called experimentals. Each faction only gets a few types, and each are immense units or buildings, capable of decimating legions of troops all by their lonesome, or entire bases in just a few shots. No one experimental is quite like another, and their variety is hugely beneficial to the game's combat. For example, one of the UEF's experimental units is a mobile factory, a massive tracked vehicle bristling with heavy weapons that can fashion entire armies by itself. Another is a gargantuan artillery piece that can hit nearly any target on the map with near flawless accuracy, and offers massive destructive potential. Often, an opponent's construction of a certain experimental can lead you to losing the game if you leave it unchecked, which often makes the late game incredibly nail-biting. Imagine building a wonder from Age of Empires, except here it has legs and a skyscraper-sized laser on the front of it. And as the scale is so large, Games have the potential to go for a long time, especially ones with multiple players and teams, so you might want to pick a smaller battlefield if you're strapped for time. And even for a game released over 10 years ago, all the explosions and effects are incredibly satisfying, and seeing an enormous experimental unit rip through an entire army with a microwave laser is something that really just never gets old. The same goes for the game's models and textures, as basically all the units are robots, it makes sense that a lot of them look quite blocky, and it helps them to not feel too out of place in an age where computer graphics are becoming so incredibly realistic. Otherwise, the game's sound effects match the game's graphics perfectly. Explosive blasts pack an appropriate punch, jet fighters shoot through the air above clashing armies, and overall it really does just feel authentic. Battles not only look impressive, they sound like they're actually raging around you, with real audible weight behind each gunshot and laser beam salvo. Even today, Supreme Commander is an excellent game, but it doesn't end there. Due to its commercial and critical success, gas-powered games would release a standalone expansion later that same year, 
Supreme Commander, Forged Alliance. Adding an entirely new faction, new units and buildings for the existing ones, overhauling the AI, altering some mechanics, and even adding a brand new campaign, Forged Alliance made for a game that everyone I've asked agrees is just flat out better than the original. The new faction was a hugely welcome addition, with a full new list of units, buildings, and of course experimentals for you to play around with. And as it's a standalone expansion, you can play it with people who own the original game, but you're limited to using the new faction. So what I'd recommend is that you grab both, and then you're able to make the most of everything the game has to offer. Forged Alliance was received just as well as the original, which is to say, people loved it. Its popularity even led to talks of a second expansion titled Experimentals, which unfortunately didn't come to fruition. Guest powered games next two projects after Spring Commander Forged Alliance were 2008's Space Siege, an action role playing game in a similar vein to their earlier title Dungeon Siege, and 2009's Demigod, a competitive MOBA. Unfortunately, neither games were received nearly as well as any of their earlier titles, and their disappointing performances led Guest Power to look towards something more familiar, something that their fans were asking for a proper sequel to Supreme Commander. Soon after the release of Forged Alliance, development on Spring Commander 2 would begin. Gas Powered Games had always been an independent studio, meaning they weren't owned by any parent company or games publisher. Throughout their many years of game development, they had partnered with many different publishers such as Microsoft for Dungeon Siege, THQ for Spring Commander, or Stardock for Demigod. And this trend continued with Spring Commander 2. Gas Powered made a deal with Japanese publisher Square Enix, and it came just at the right time. Guest Powered had been struggling financially, and things were starting to look dire for the company. And it just so happened that Square Enix, while known for making local Japanese series like Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy, were looking to expand their reach in the Western market. And Square Enix was very interested at the time in acquiring IP, and if you remember, in the, in I think it was pretty global, but in the US there was this massive financial recession. It was devastating and we were in terrible financial condition as a company and here was this amazing opportunity to work with Square Enix, uh, sell them the IP to the game, uh, get a contract for a sequel and put the company back on its feet financially. Uh, not ideal, it's not what you want to do, but in the, if you look at a recession and you look at how many companies just go out of business, if you say to yourself, would you rather go out of business or, you know, kind of sacrifice a limb, you know, uh, you know, you choose the lesser of the two. Uh, yeah, and you do what you need to do. In June of 2009, Supreme Commander 2 was shown at E3, and questions were immediately asked about how it compared to the first game. For anyone familiar with the original game, one look at the sequel would be enough to see it was vastly different. In March of 2010, players got their chance to experience it for themselves, and on release while being an overall success, it received more of a mixed reception from fans of its predecessor, with the main complaint being its considerably simplified gameplay. The biggest difference was in its scale. While the strategic zoom from the first game still existed, overall there's less unit variety, there's less on screen, and the scale of everything feels significantly smaller with a reduction in the size disparity between a lot of the units. It was the same with the game's mechanics. The three tech levels had been removed, instead being replaced by a single tech tree, which was decidedly simpler to understand, but offered far fewer options for advancing your technology. Through this tree, you could upgrade units with stat bonuses or new abilities, enhance your ACU, and unlock new units, buildings, and of course, experimentals. Research points are handled as a third resource to complement mass and power, and they're generated passively either through combat or by building dedicated facilities. It's a decent system, and by the end of a game you can expect to have most, if not all of the tree filled out, so luckily you're never too far away from getting the things you want. Overall, the gameplay was similar, despite a lot of the mechanics being streamlined quite a bit. The three factions from the original game made a return, and came with the same trappings that original players had grown familiar with. Not present are the Seraphim from Forged Alliance, and if you've played that game's campaign, then you know why they aren't there. 
Lore aside, having only three factions definitely feels like a step back in terms of variety, and I feel like that extends to the core factions as well. As there are no tech levels, the number of units and buildings available for you to create has been significantly reduced, and this leads to each faction not feeling nearly as varied as their Supreme Kind of One counterparts. And while the experimental units are of course as awesome as ever, the lack of variety hurts the game's longevity when compared to Supreme Commander 1. Here's an example. In the original game, the UEF are the only faction to have access to tier 3 point defense turrets, and since each tier is on such a different power level than the others, it means the UEF has a distinct advantage in their ability to dig in defensively in the late game. In Supreme Commander 2, having no separate tiers means everyone gets access to the core buildings, and the upgrades and minor stat alterations that separate them are a far cry from what people had been used to and expected from the last game. While some may wave it away as bad design, or say the developers didn't know what they were doing, in reality it's usually not that simple. There are always other factors in play, and in this case, Chris and Gas Powered Games definitely had their reasons for simplifying the sequel. Yeah, there was absolutely a decision early on, and this was a publisher-developer decision. This mm. is a this is a, a partnership decision, where we said, well, let's make something that's not quite as hardcore, yeah, not quite as deep, um, and we it fit with the it fit with the timeline because we knew we couldn't spend four years on it. Four years was too long. See, Dungeon Siege was four years. Supreme Commander One O was four years. Um, we knew we couldn't spend four years. We, we spent like two years, I think maybe, uh, it might've been a little less. It was a pretty big at fast effort, but then again, you, you realize you have all this pathfinding done. Well, we, we, there was an innovation. There was the flow field pathfinding system, which was a huge breakthrough in pathfinding. Um, I thought so it was costly in some other areas, memory and so on, but it was a really amazing, uh, pathfinding. It was really smooth and flow field pathfinding. I mean, you can see videos on it online. It, it's a pretty amazing stuff. Um, but, uh, all things combined, the way that that turned out was, uh, smaller scale, yeah. smaller maps, um, faster gameplay, a little more arcade action gameplay, trying to expand the audience, and of course running on the 360, uh, which meant that it had to have a smaller memory footprint on it. And there wasn't time to hand tune it for both. So compromise that we made for the 360 found their way back into the PC, into the PC version, and the PC uh, manifested itself with some quirky things that you wouldn't see in the console. So, you know, that's one of the challenges when you have a, when you have a title that you have to get out in a small period of time on two platforms. But that's not to say there's nothing that the game does better than before, because there is. A lot of small additions are hugely welcome, such as the ability to launch experimental units half-baked and get them into battle before being fully built, or how you can apply extra individual modules to factories, like shield generators or anti-air turrets. Despite its mechanical differences to Supreme Commander 1, the actual gameplay of the sequel is still a ton of fun. Because of changes like smaller maps and having less time required to get your best units, you generally get into the action a lot quicker, and this pairs fantastically with the game's substantial graphical upgrades. All the units and buildings have a lot of detail to them, especially when you're using the game's strategic zoom to get right into the action. There are even visual changes when you apply an upgrade to a factory or unit. Nice. But I think my favourite part of Spring Commander 2's graphics are the effects, which are incredibly satisfying throughout the whole game. They're complemented further by the excellent sound design, which is just as good as it was in its predecessor. It might even be better. Lasers cut through the air, artillery pieces fire ordnance from across the map with a hefty punch, and makes the game's theatre of war feel all that more believable. All in all, the game is really action-packed, and honestly quite fast-paced, especially when compared to Spring Commander 1. It's also a lot more accessible, due to its easier to understand systems and lower hardware requirements. But that came with a cost, and anyone who's heard the words more accessible knows the negative stigma associated with it. And this leads me to my conclusion of Spring Commander 2. It's a great game, and an excellent RTS, but it's not the best of sequels. The first game's core audience didn't necessarily want streamlined systems. They didn't want a faster pace. What they wanted was a sequel made from the same mold as the original, 
an in-depth tactical RTS on a massive scale that allowed for a real strategy to be employed and rewarded the more methodical, disciplined player. Unfortunately, that's just not what Springfinder 2 provided. Many in that devoted group of fans harboured a lot of disdain for it because of these reasons, and honestly I can fully understand the sentiment. In my mind, it's still an excellent RTS, but for different reasons than its predecessor because at the end of the day, it just didn't really stand as an overall improvement of the game's original formula. Just more of a repainted, repackaged take on the same idea. And while it was a relative success, Spring Commander 2 unfortunately didn't receive any Forged Alliance size expansions. There was a single DLC titled the Infinite War Battle Pack, which included new maps, units and buildings, but nothing game changing like a new faction. After Spring Commander 2 had been released, Guest Powered Games efforts were refocused to new projects, and unfortunately it was shaping up to be a pretty rocky road ahead. That was a really, it was a really tough time because what was happening in the business is um, things were transitioning to console, uh, publishers were taking teams internally, there was a big change in the industry and the company didn't have, Gaspard Games didn't have the financial, financial um, resources, reserves to really do much. So we were kind of, if we weren't signing deals, we were going under and a lot of developers closed up what happened with us is we were on super lean we were running on fumes i uh, had the kickstarter for wild man which was like a hail mary right yeah and something to be sort of explained because it's never really been explained in, in great detail was you know supreme commander cost you know almost 11 million dollars um dungeon siege 10 was about half that about 6.3 million and development costs are arising and big players coming to the game were soaking up all these engineers and great talent great artists great everybody was getting paid huge amounts of money and they really still are uh, there's a lot of money to be made in gaming when you're at the top of your craft and of course if you're a studio like gpg you have to you you're putting out games that people expect to be triple a games high quality games right? they didn't expect the games to be sort of cheap uh b minus games yeah so you have to be able to pay the salaries of these high-end these incredibly talented people well that became harder and harder you had rising costs and you had um it, it was harder and harder to sign deals and the deals were getting smaller and smaller so games were going from 11 million uh they were going to 5 million and then here's a kickstarter so this explains doing a kickstarter and we're trying to raise 1.1 or 1.2 million dollars for yeah. wild man and we're at six hundred thousand dollars, and the campaign is you know twenty days in or something. I forget. And and it was like we're ne this is not going to work. And these folks on the team and I pretty much had a nervous breakdown. I mean, I literally had a nervous breakdown, which which I guess it wasn't really. Well, I guess I didn't have a full like hospitalized. <laughs> but I was I was a wreck. Right. So technically, I guess maybe I yeah. didn't. We'll have to kind of, I have to find the right, like, nervous breakdown, like, six out of ten. It wasn't a good okay. time. It was not a good time. Well, one of the things that's, when you start a company, uh, like Gaspard Games, and I, I signed my very first deal, um, it's, it's, you get advances to make the game, but it's not your money. You take a loan right. from the publisher. And the publisher, it's what's called a non-refundable loan, because you get these advances, and then when the game goes to market and it starts to sell, you get a percentage of the royalty. Never got a royalty check in 15 years running Gaspar wow. Games. Wow. Nothing ever made That's money. Crazy. Because there's, like, there's such good games. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody ever paid us a royalty check. Like if I had got a royalty check, I would have probably had a picture of me with it and went, oh my God, a royalty check. But no, no, never got a royalty check. Once 2013 rolled around, Guess Powered Games had reached a tipping point. In the short span of just a few weeks, the company had been forced to lay off nearly the entirety of its workforce due to financial struggles, just days after launching their Kickstarter for their new game Wildman. Admirably, this was done to make sure all affected employees would receive their severance and holiday pay, 
something that may not have been possible had they stayed employed and the project had failed. Not longer after going live, the Kickstarter was cancelled and the company found itself on life support. Fortunately, the Belarusian developer Wargaming swooped in at the 11th hour and bought Gas Power Games for an undisclosed amount. Some former staff were able to be rehired, but the team found itself swept up in a larger corporation's vast ocean of bureaucracy and stripped of the autonomy that made it such a unique, effective operation. To his credit, Chris did stay with the company, which had been renamed Wargaming Seattle, and for a while, things were actually starting to look positive. In March of that same year, a significant patch was delivered for Supreme Commander 2, and four months later, Wargaming purchased the intellectual property rights for Total Annihilation. Something was going on, and speculation was running wild. And later that year, Chris hinted to PC Gamer that there might even be a new game in the series in the works. But, to the dismay of many, nothing would come of it. Wargaming Seattle went on to have no new releases, and Chris departed the company at the end of 2016 to pursue new ventures. And finally, in March of 2018, 20 years after being founded and 11 years after releasing Supreme Commander, Wargaming Seattle, gas-powered games, turned off the lights for the last time, closed by its parent company and leaving 150 employees out of a job. It was a sad end to a developer with such a respected reputation as Gas Powered Games. Theirs is a story fraught with ups, downs, and the underlying fact that no matter how hard you try, how much passion you have for your craft, or how many successful titles you have under your belt, sometimes your best just isn't enough in such a fickle, cutthroat industry. But like I said at the start, all good things must come to an end. And it's never too late for a new beginning. Chris has recently announced a new project, along with his new company, Kanugi. Titled Intergalactic Space Empire, Chris's new RTS aims to be both a great game and a forerunner for new technologies. Instead of being a traditional game where you download the files and run it locally, Intergalactic Space Empire will be housed entirely in the cloud and can be accessed by nearly any modern web browser on your computer, phone, tablet, you name it. It's still in development, but Chris is hoping for a beta release near the end of 2019. The idea is exciting, and the thought of being able to play a proper multiplayer strategy game on basically any device with a modern web browser is a really exciting one. And personally, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the project turns out in the long run. Without a doubt, Supreme Commander was, and still is, a great series. The incredible enthusiasm and effort that Chris Taylor and his team at Gas Powered Games invested in its development is undeniable. As a follow-on to one of the most popular RTSs of the 90s, there were a lot of expectations riding on its shoulders, but its critical and commercial success cemented its creator's reputation as some of the best in their field, and while Spring Commander 2 was disparaged by a lot of fans for falling short of its predecessor's high calibre, it was still an excellent game in its own right, and it stands as a great example of a fast-paced, action-focused RTS with more tactical depth than many of its contemporaries. While we always hope for more of what we love, we need to recognise why that is. The level by which we determine our wants and desires are often defined by our past experiences. Supreme Commander set an extremely high bar for quality of experience and sheer enjoyment. It has left a lasting mark on not only the RTS landscape, but also on its devout player base, which still thrives to this day. And it's very apparent that the love for it will be around for a while yet. Take Forged Alliance Forever for instance. A community project for the Forged Alliance expansion that facilitates online play long after the official servers had been shut down, and it's still undergoing development to this day. And like many classic PC games, there's an array of mods available that can change up the experience considerably. We're fortunate that there's nothing keeping us from enjoying today what we originally fell in love with all those years ago. To appreciate it, and give it the respect it deserves. Despite Gas Powered Games' closure and having not seen any official spark of life out of Supreme Commander in over six years, I am optimistic for the future. Not for the series specifically, but the idea of the series. While other companies now own the intellectual property rights, and while we will probably never see a Supreme Commander 3, I truly believe that its spirit lives on today in different forms, such as in community projects and in the mind of its creator. I'm confident we will see its influential legacy continue to live on, and so does Chris Taylor. So would there be plans to, like, you know, do a big flashy, like, 3D RTS again? 
maybe in the yes, this platform. Absolutely. I think that I, at one time I said no, um, just because of the content. But you know, it'd be really fun is to get the platform off the ground in a couple of years, like four or five years from now. Really, kind of let the let the tech mm. kind of evolve some more. I mean, the phones are just getting insanely powerful. Um, and then do something big uh, and do kind of another spiritual successor game, but do something really fresh. There has to be something to right. the experience, which is just really, really fresh. I can't just stamp out games like a factory. Uh, I had a big argument with a friend. We were talking about art versus product. And I said, we do not make products, we make art. And they're like, they're, they're, one of the things they had online on their LinkedIn is like, we make products that people love. And I was like, no, 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 no. We do not make products. We make games, create experiences. And we pour a love and our parts of our soul into these games that we make. And so um, if, if it doesn't have something fresh, if it doesn't have something new, if it doesn't elevate the art, then it's not worth doing.